Welcome everyone. Um, good morning and welcome to the UBC Learning Circle. Today we'll be talking about nourishing community wellness, stories, learning, connecting, healing through food. Uh, today's conversation is in, presented in partnership with First Nations Health Authority, Neutronals Tribal Council, um, Island Health, uh, Indigenous Health Program, and the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health. We'd like to thank First Nations Health Authority for generously funding the UBC Learning Circle and allowing us to have these conversations. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge with respect and gratitude that I'm joining you from the um, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. Feel free to introduce yourselves and your nation while you um, in the chat box below. Um, today, we're going to be exploring um, a panel of dietitians working in Indigenous health. And joining us for this interactive panel um, will be introduced by Fiona, the moderator. And I'll ask all panelists to introduce themselves in the time being. And for those who don't know me, my name is Serene Squawkin. I'm the new Learning Circle Manager. Um, I just started at the start of the month, and I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, and joining us today, working behind the scenes, is Cynthia Long. Um, she's our production coordinator, and um, yeah, and she'll just be interacting in the background with everyone in the chat box. And finally, before we get into today's discussion, uh, I will just provide a gentle heads up that the topics covered may be sensitive or emotionally triggering. Please uh, make sure to look after yourself. Uh, and if at any point that you feel that you need to talk to a friend, elder, counselor, or family member, don't hesitate to do so. We have some prompts in the chat for you if you have any, if you need additional support. And I will now turn it to uh, Fiona, the moderator. Oh, thank you, Serene, so much for setting the table for us in such a good way. I'm really honored to be able to be standing alongside my um, peers and mentors and dear friends, my dietitian friends, as um, they share today. So I have the honor of just kind of setting our table for this conversation. And I, in doing so, um, must take that moment to acknowledge the homelands. And I know there's so many people, I think there's a hundred or so of you and calling all over the province. And so honoring all those nations whose homelands we're on today. Um, of course, uh, UBC with the Squamish, the Slay with Tooth and the Musqueam. Um, but I'm calling in from the unceded un, uh, ancestral homelands of the Lekwungen speaking peoples. Um, and so just wanting to uh, acknowledge them and acknowledge Lekwungen, um, the song he's in Esquimalt nations. Uh, for their care and advocacy of these homelands since time out of mind. And I was thinking um, uh, the word Lekwungen um, is a place to smoke herring. And whenever I'm wandering around these lands that I occupy and benefit off of, I think about what these lands used to look like and how abundant the food used to be when I think about what downtown Victoria or Matulia looks like. And so just um, as we talk about food, acknowledging how colonization um, and colonial policies have and continue to impact Indigenous food systems. And um, I know my mentors and friends will talk more about the work they're doing to restore and reconnect and revitalize Indigenous food systems. So I am honored to be here. I am a daughter, a sister, an auntie, and a friend. I'm a white settler of Irish ancestry, and I've occupied uh, Treaty 6 territory, uh, the Cowichan homelands, and then now here, Lekwungen homelands. So I know we're going to have a great session, and I uh, know that uh, my my peers, Rachel Dickin, Je uh, Tessie Harris, and Jesse Newman are going to share. They're going to introduce themselves in a good way. And so I'm looking forward. Um, and please uh, be active in the chat. We want to get to know you and answer your questions. Um, and we've, I think we've set at least 20 minutes for questions. So we want to hear from you and have that dialogue. So I'm going to pass it over to Jesse uh, first, 
and thank you for um, everything. Thank you, Fiona. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, super happy to be here today uh, and happy that you could join us. Um, I, I'm not sure if we're gonna go straight into the presentation or if we're just gonna briefly introduce ourselves. Um, I know we have a slideshow. Uh, but my name is Jesse Newman. I'm from, I grew up in Hagilda, Skidigat, um, and Wag Lisla, Bella Bella. I'm Hiltzuk on my mother, or sorry, Haida on my mother's side, and Hiltzuk and Kwakwakiwak on my father's side. Um, I am currently in the position of Indigenous Health Dietitian with Island Health. Uh, working with nations on Northern Vancouver Island, um, working towards their goals in food sovereignty and um, food security plus diabetes management and prevention. Um, so growing up, I was very lucky that um, I came from two fishing families. So I always had um, great access to my, my ancestral foods. Um, and, and saw the benefits. Um, okay, here are the slides, yay. Um, and I did forget to mention um, that I am located this morning in the homelands of the Likwila speaking peoples, the Wiwakai and the Wiwakum. Um, so to start, I would like to share a bit about myself. Um, I did say a bit at the start, but um, I would say um, growing up, my Nanai and my Chennai had probably the greatest influence on me. And you can see them on the photo in the, the top right there. You can see me as a, a child um, in the yellow jacket and um, my Chennai is holding me and my Nanai is in the background there. But um, I, I would say my Chennai probably had the biggest influence on me. Um, he was a fisherman, he was a hunter, he was a politician, um, he did so much for our community. And um, that had a huge influence on me. I saw the importance that he put on our foods. He made sure that um, everybody was provided for the elders in the community. Um, those that couldn't afford food, but he was just um, what I consider to be uh, like the prototype of a Haida man. Like he just, he, he provided for everybody and that had um, a huge influence on me and um, was definitely one of the reasons that I chose to, I chose a food or a career in food. And so, um, uh, one of the things that I love to do the most is um, be in the kitchen cooking with other people. Um, you can see a photo of me on the top left um, working on clams. Um, some of my favorite foods are sockeye and um, berries. I have really good memories um, of fishing, like being in Copper Bay, which is one of our um, gathering areas, territories on Haida Gwaii uh, for sockeye in, in May or June. I loved how it uh, really brought our family together, how we would all go over there and be together during that time. Um, but also out on the boat with, um, with my, my father's side of the family in the summer. Um, and I'll speak to that a bit more in a moment. Um, on the bottom there, you can see a photo of uh, my grandfather and my Ada. Um, and that was at their wedding um, in the big house in Yalis or Alert Bay with the rest of our family. Um, and salmon berries, I have good memories. Um, my nun, I love salmon berries. So I used to really like going out picking for her. So May and June is kind of like a really um, nice time for me. Um, and outside of that, I really like um, hiking. I enjoy biking. Those are probably my two favorite activities outside of work. And on the bottom left there, you can see um, my bike in Yalis um, Alert Bay. And on 
the bottom uh, as well next to that, you can see a photo of me um, on Sleeping Beauty in Haida Gwaii, one of my favorite places in the world. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, so I mentioned that uh, I was very lucky that I came from two fishing families. This, these are photos of um, me out with my father's side of the family mainly. Um, me and my sister were really lucky that we got to go out. Um, it was a really tight-knit crew. It was my grandfather, um, my dad, my uncles, my cousins. Um, and like I have such good memories of us sitting around um, the kitchen table um, having we would have sockeye every day or fish every day but like I always felt really lucky um, to do that and to be with my family and it was um, such a good time and on the bottom there there's a photo of my dad and my chennai with halibut and I just remember like our lives um, really like revolving around like food and the seasons of food. And I felt um, like very lucky for that. Um, so can I get the next slide, please? And I wanna speak a bit more about um, like why I do what I do. So these are two women who were um, really important to me. Um, this is my, my Auntie Muriel on the left here, my great Auntie Muriel. Um, and my nanai, uh, Verna, next to her. And I grew up next door to my Auntie Muriel. So um, got to see her pretty much every day. Um, and my nanai lived down the road from me. And um, I was with her quite a bit because I was very close with one of my cousins who um, lived with her. So I was there all the time. And so, um, my nanai was an amazing cook. She was also always um, taking care of what my chennai brought home, um, like fishing or hunting. Um, really loved having the family together um, over meals. Like we would always be down there and she really loved that. And I saw how um, like her, her food really brought us together. Um, and they both had diabetes and um, I, I watched them kind of like struggle through it when I was younger and sort of dismiss it or not really um, knowing how or what it was doing to their bodies. Um, and I think a lot of that had to do with like racism within the healthcare system, like them really not wanting to go um, to see a doctor or a nurse around their diabetes, um, not, not really being told how diabetes was affecting um, their bodies and just basically being told that you need to take these pills and you shouldn't eat sugar. And so I didn't really see them um, like manage it well and saw the effect that it took on their bodies. I remember my auntie Muriel um, at one point had to go on dialysis. Um, and, and so like it um, just seeing how it affected them and knowing that there was a big um, like link between nutrition and health outcomes really wanted me to, um, really made me um, want to get into a profession that I could possibly do something about that. And so um, that's why I chose to get into dietetics. And that's why I really love working in diabetes prevention and management. Um, so if I could get the next slide, please. And so before I pass it over to Rachel, um, I want to speak about the Indigenous determinants of health just a little bit because it certainly informed my life um, and the way that I practice and I'm sure the way that we all practice. Um, the determinants of health basically are um, like things that um, influence our health outcomes and so um, I love this diagram by Charlotte Loppy um, out of UVic. It, I think it's an amazing um, 
uh, visual. I think using a tree as a metaphor for um, the indigenous determinants of health is, it's, it's really great. I use it a lot and I'm just gonna, um, I'm gonna use it to talk a bit about um, like how I, how I talk about this. So I've had a few discussions recently um, with people who I consider like well-educated and, um, you know, like don't really get, don't really get it. Like we've had discussions about like diabetes and obesity. And I think a lot of people um, point to like chips and pop as, or laziness as, um, as to why we we have like higher rates of diabetes in our our communities, and um, and it's a much larger issue. So, um, like if you take a look at this, you can see that um, Dr. Loppy's um, um, uh, she's got the determinants here in black, and so I've added. Um, some of my own um, determinants in the red here. And so this is just like basically from my lived experience of growing up in indigenous communities. Um, if you take a look at the roots, of course you can see that residential school um, continues to have um, like a larger um, influence on our outcomes. So um, according to this diagram, the determinants at the roots tend to um, be a little bit more out of our control, have a bigger influence on our health outcomes. And so um, a lot of people think, well, residential school was a long time ago, like how can this possibly be having, um, having an effect on indigenous peoples now? But I would say that the trauma and the abuse that um, many people um, endured in residential schools is probably still um, having one of the greatest influences on Indigenous people's health right now. Um, and that has a lot to do with like um, the abuse that Indigenous peoples um, uh, especially like sexual abuse, emotional abuse, uh, physical abuse, and the cycle of abuse that continues in our communities today. Um, so when I think of um, my families, my two families, like they're both um, very like close and tight knit, but um, my both of my Hilsa grandparents went to residential school and um, both of my um, Haida uh, grandparents went to day school. And so um, just having that difference, like yes, day school was um, like traumatic in itself, but um, I would say not as traumatic as residential school and the outcomes um, that that's had on my family. Like, I just don't remember, like my grandparents, my Haida grandparents did not drink alcohol. Um, my mother didn't drink alcohol. There was less like violence, uh, premature death, like alcoholism, suicide in my um, Haida family as opposed to my Helsic family. So I really see that as um, having one of the greatest, um, as one of the greatest determinants on our health and in our communities. Um, and if you look at the bottom here, you can see um, like the Indian Act, I would say displacement just in my, um, in my, my short career and especially in working with um, Kwak Wakiwak communities on the North, um, many of them have been displaced and severely displaced from their traditional territories. Um, so I think this has had like a much bigger effect than most people really um, emphasize. Not um, having, you know, like some of them are in landlocked communities, um, whereas like traditionally they've been like directly um, on the ocean. And so just not being able to access our foods, I believe has had like a really great um, effect on our health. And, um, and then you can see like racism. I feel like that's had a big effect, like people not wanting to go um, to, to um, 
to access healthcare. Um, and a lot of that, like stemming from residential school, like um, constantly being told that we're less than or we're worthless. Like if you if you keep telling this to people, they're gonna start to believe it. And so um, that's something that we've taken on that. And so that's why I've added internalized racism there. I believe it's like a huge barrier to um, like wanting to take care of yourself and believing that you're worth it and accessing um, accessing that healthcare. Um, and so lateral violence, that's something that I've added as well. Um, like if you're a healthcare provider who's working in community, that might not be something that um, you would know is going on unless you were actually living in community. And um, if you don't know what lateral violence is, it's basically um, like harassment and bullying within community members that can happen within um, oppressed communities. And I think that's a huge determinant um, and a huge issue that happens in our communities. And then all of this um, combined, like adding up to um, like higher rates of diabetes and heart disease and um, either a lack or loss of identity, um, I believe all of these are um, like huge barriers to um, our health and our wellness. Um, and so like sometimes it can seem quite overwhelming for me, especially as a healthcare provider who um, like works in, in public health. What, um, and I used to think like, okay, what can I do as a dietitian? Like it, it just can seem quite overwhelming. Um, but as, as my career has pro progressed, I have seen like, and I've always kind of known this, but like our foods are, are so healing um, and learning more about our foods and how to harvest them and just seeing the effect that it can have on people when they have greater access to their foods. Um, I think that it can really help to heal the trauma um, within our population. So um, with that, I'm gonna leave it and I'm gonna pass it over to Rachel. Thank you so much, Jesse. That was amazing. I learn so much from you every time. Um, and thank you, Fiona, for introducing us in such a good way and to all the organizers and to Tessie for also sharing this space. And for everyone else that's watching, um, I'm really grateful for being here today. So my name's Rachel Dickens, and today I'm calling in from the beautiful um, unceded and ancestral homelands of the colloquial First Nation. So colonially known as Tofino. Um, I've learned its colloquial name is Nachucks. I'm originally from Prince Rupert. So there on the screen with the two dogs is my nephew and my brother in Prince Rupert. Um, known as the rainiest place in Canada. And, and now I think I live in the second rainiest place in Canada. Um, on the top there with the totem pole, that's some um, colloquial territory. So that is Tofino overlooking Mears Island. Um, I'm of mixed ancestry. So on my father's side, I'm a member of the Lox Kalam Band, um, which is a Shimshian nation made up of nine of the 14 allied tribes. And for those of you who don't know, who are watching, Lox Kolams is about 30 kilometers north of Prince Rupert by boat. And on my mother's side, I'm first generation Chinese to these homelands. Um, I was trained as a registered dietitian and certified diabetes educator, but I would call myself a food lover. So um, a photo there is um, a bowl um, with lots of good ingredients. I love taking photos of healthy meals and sharing the recipes with community and friends. And on the bottom right, um, if you can't recognize that, that is um, fish eggs or fish roe that's been baked. One of my favorite foods. Um, so I'm also an auntie, a daughter, a sister. I'm a student, um, a future researcher, a friend and a lifelong learner. And for the last two years, I've had the privilege of working alongside the New Chalneth people. Um, and I'm currently employed by the New Chalneth Tribal Council. 
Um, next slide, please. So I, like Jesse, wanted to share some photos of my family. Um, I think it's important to honor our ancestors as they are, who made us who we are today. Um, on the top left, those are my great, great grandparents um, and then my great grandma in Loxco Lambs. And then underneath that's my great grandparents who um, immigrated to Prince Rupert. My grandpa Ted loved hunting and loved fishing and loved smoking fish. Um, and then there's my granny there with some, some big fish as well. And then on my mother's side, um, those are my grandparents and they immigrated from mainland China to Hong Kong after the second world war and then to what is now known as Canada in the 1970s. And then you can see below there, there's my immediate family. Um, and so I just wanted to say that um, just like Jesse, I'm introducing myself purposely um, for this relational work. And I would do a variation of this through conversation when meeting people for the first time in community. Um, I find that working in community it is important to place yourself and to share who you are and where you come from. Um, and this allows people to um, have the opportunity to connect you to places or to others that they might know. And I find that once you start the conversation, it is likely that you will find many connections. Um, next slide, please. Um, so many of you who are watching are likely familiar with this um, framework, which was introduced by the Mi'kmaq elder Albert Marshall. So I find that it really resonates with me because, um, so due to the residential school system, and all the racist policies that preceded and followed, I did not have the privilege of growing up in community or in culture. So I was schooled in the Western sense, and I recognized that my education was deeply rooted in Eurocentric beliefs. And I think like many people who grew up disconnected from a part of their heritage, um, the opportunity to bring together multiple ways of knowing really resonates. So having that Western science training, but also seeing the power and expertise that comes from within community, um, utilizing both perspectives really allows us to take on the best of both worlds to support different initiatives. So I chose this image in particular with the two circles um, with the shared space in the middle. Um, I like that it kind of shows that there's a common ground in the middle, which I think can be viewed as where diverse knowledge systems can coexist. So kind of each informing the other. Um, and I just wanted to share this quote from Elder Albert Marshall. Our journey here is not meant for one perspective or one consciousness to get us through. We all need each other. The lessons that we are trying to put forward to our young people, it is going to be more expedient if we can take the best, the tools of the white man, and then the tools our forefathers left us with. So I really hope that this two-eyed seeing approach can guide um, my future projects uh, within my role in community and that by taking the best from both worlds and using the insights from both the indigenous ways of knowing, um, which are grounded in interconnectedness and reciprocity, and then also the Western ways of knowing and seeing the world, um, I really hope we can imagine the way that reimagine the way we're supporting those living with diabetes and prevent diabetes uh, for future generations. And with that, I'll pass it on to Tessie. Awesome. Well, first, thank you so much, uh, Jesse and Rachel, for sharing those pieces of your stories. I feel that every time I, I get to hear you share your stories, I learn so much. And I just have so much respect for, for what you bring. Um, and thanks to Fiona for holding this space and for also being such a great role model and inspiration to me. Uh, so my name is Tessie Harris. Um, I want to start by acknowledging that I'm joining today from the unceded uh, traditional and occupied territories of the Musqueam, the tsleil and the Squamish peoples. And it's a privilege to live on these lands as an uninvited guest. And I want to recognize and express my gratitude to those nations who have such deep connections and relationship and history with these lands that I'm on. So uh, I'm also a dietitian, and I'm going to share a little bit uh, about myself and my journey um, into dietetics and my journey into community and into Indigenous health. 
Um, so I'm of mixed European ancestry. Um, I have German heritage on my mother's side and Scottish on my father's side. And I have a photo here with my mother, who's a big inspiration to me. And also with my, my father and four siblings below. And I just wanna really recognize that their support and encouragement have enabled me to be where I am today. And beyond that, I'm a person with many layers of privilege. I'm white, I'm Anglophone, I'm able-bodied, I'm cisgendered, and among many other things, these have all given me much greater access to things such as education and other opportunities, which again, allow me to be in the position that I am today. So I recognize that I don't have to advocate just to exist and to live my life. And this is white privilege, and there's a responsibility that comes with that to make meaningful change in the systems around me for those that don't have the same opportunities. So uh, the other photo on the left there um, brings me a lot of joy. To me, this photo is a feeling and it really exemplifies the role of food in my life, which is the feeling of being around loved ones and sharing an abundance of food that we've grown together, that we've prepared together and that we'll share together. And to me, these are the moments that make life rich and across cultures, um, I think we can recognize that food brings people together. And this is really what drew me to dietetics. As well as I've always been really fascinated by systems and the way things work together. And in studying dietetics, I was hoping to get a better understanding of sort of the intersections of, of food and health and culture and society and economy and and like I've said, how food connects so many aspects of our lives. But through my undergrad, I was pretty disappointed with the compartmentalization of all of these pieces. Um, we would learn about each thing in isolation. So we'd talk about like sort of macro and micronutrients and calories and talk about physical health and isolation from the rest of ourselves and everything in our lives. And we would talk about programs that for the most part would ignore the influence of the social determinants of health, which Jesse so like um, powerfully spoke to. So this all made food and nutrition feel really flat to me and lacking the dimension and the connections that I was so curious about. And as I started to um, think about these things more, more and read more, um, I started to come across and hear more Indigenous voices and perspectives that had been very much lacking in my university education. And just hearing people talk about their own relationships with food um, and the interconnections with culture and identity and land, I was so inspired and um, recognized I had so much to learn from Indigenous approaches to wellness and to food. And the second big piece uh, of this is that, that, you know, that really influenced my journey into Indigenous health was learning and recognizing, as has already been spoke to, um, the immense deficits in our healthcare system and how in order to work towards reconciliation, it cannot only be on the shoulders of Indigenous people to, to break down and rebuild these massive um, and oppressive systems. So my hope as a dietitian and as a uh, healthcare provider is to take on some of that work as best as I can. And uh, I was listening to the learning circle early in the week um, and uh, Chief Lynn Malerba, she said, there's no substitute for a seat at the table. And I absolutely agree with that and recognize that I cannot at all take that seat, but I can advocate to continue to create space when that seat is either not there or if that seat is not safe to invite Indigenous people in to share their perspectives and hopes uh, for healthcare. Um, so on the next slide, please. After uh, graduating, um, I was so, so fortunate um, to accept a job on uh, Haida territory, on Haida Gwaii. And, uh, and so moved there and was able to work alongside uh, an amazing healthcare team as well as just such an incredible community. And I was blessed with so much time working with food. So either growing or preparing or harvesting, sharing food with many wonderful people and hearing their stories. 
And I learned so much from the generosity of those who, who shared their stories and their time with me. And I feel strongly that sort of our mutual respect for food and a mutual love for food helped bring us together. And that time really building relationships, um, just, yeah, I'm so grateful for everything that I, that I learned um, from those relationships um, about traditional foods, about food systems, uh, stories and protocol. And this was really when I started to take a lot of time to reflect on my own biases and blind spots and how I can show up in the work um, in, in more uh, supportive and um, more culturally safe ways. On the next slide. So in addition to my time in community, um, one of the most powerful learning experience was um, being part of the Graduate certi Certificate in Indigenous Public Health through the Center of Excellence in Indigenous Health at UBC. I cannot say enough how amazing this program was, uh, spending time listening to Indigenous elders and knowledge carriers and leaders healthcare champions, there are indigenous nurses and doctors, and just so many incredible uh, people with um, powerful life stories and teachings to share. And this really accelerated my unlearning and challenging the things that I had learned um, in my life up until this point, either narratives that I'd been taught or assumptions that I had um, that, are, that I build my worldview upon. So, I think a key takeaway from this, there's, there was so many learnings, but a, a key was that self-determination is a path forward and that to practice allyship, the best thing I can do is to step back and to listen to indigenous people and communities and then use my energy and my voice to support their visions and priorities. And next slide. So another really formative experience that I'll speak to briefly uh, was my participation in the NOURISH program. And I'll, I will come back to this a bit later in the presentation. Um, but I wanna read this quote here that um, we're not just working in food and health systems. We're working in deeply entrenched and invisible systems of power like colonization and capitalism. And um, yeah, again, Jesse spoke to this as well as Rachel, and I just feel this is huge and we could take our whole time today unpacking this. Um, but just to expand on it slightly, I feel that the fundamental values that we have in healthcare of how decisions are made and services are delivered and basically healthcare as we know it is a system built on Western ideology and understandings. And while we're working on and we're talking about food and nutrition and well-being today, uh, we must understand the systems that surround and influence it and identify who holds the power, what are the motivations in these systems and the values driving that, and what are the leverage points, so places that we can uh, make change. So that was a lot to uh, try to capture a bit of my journey into this work. Um, I'll leave it at that and I'll pass it back to Jessie to speak uh, about some of the amazing work she's a part of on Vancouver Island. I believe I got cut off. <laughs> um, I just wanted to say um, how to Rachel and Tessie, that was incredible. I feel so fortunate to have you as peers in this profession. That was amazing. Um, so what I wanna briefly talk about today um, is an initiative that's happening on the North Island, um, Vancouver Island currently. Um, and it's quite unique. Um, and uh, locations of the program, um, Sakana, Ahadis, Ukleji, Yili, Squiestums, um, and so just just briefly, um, what what happened within our program? And these are the partners um, involved at the bottom there. There's um, 
I, I don't think I mentioned that I work for Island Health. I work within the Indigenous Health Program um, and they have a grant pro program um, funding initiatives uh, for First Nations communities. And so they let us know um, just as COVID was coming out that they had some money left over and they were hoping to support um, food security and food sovereignty on the North Island. And so when I say they, I mean me and Fiona, who was previously um, my, my partner. Um, and so we were like, okay, what can we do? How can we support um, like food sovereignty on the North Island? We saw a lot happening on the South Island. Um, and we were like, well, wouldn't it be cool if um, we could create some knowledge keeper positions in community? Um, because I think that's one of the like real barriers in um, grant applications is that um, the funds can't go towards wages of somebody working in community, well, most initiatives anyways. And so this is something that we proposed um, to um, our managers and our directors, and they agreed to um, match funds um, from our island food hubs, which are a collective of agencies working and food security on Vancouver Island. Um, and so they had funds through the Community Food Action Initiative, um, $29,000 that they were willing to, to put towards um, an Indigenous food sovereignty or food security initiative. Um, we wanted to support Indigenous-led work in community around food security and food sovereignty. And so um, we had this we had $58,000 um, that we could put towards this. And um, we wanted to fund one position in New Chalna territory and one in Kwakwakiwak territory. And so um, uh, we partnered with two First Nations. Uh, one was the Wheatlala U in um, Northern Vancouver Island in Yalis or Alert Bay. And um, they are a group of four displaced nations uh, living within Numgis territory, and those nations are the Mamalilakala, the Loitsas, the Dinokdao, and the Kwiwatsutno Huimasas. And in New Chalmers territory, we chose the Moachit Muchalit, and um, the Knowledge Keeper also supports Ahadasat and New Chatlet. And um, so we wanted to support um, Indigenous-led work, and um, these two nations were chosen because they um, they weren't they were you know in rural or remote areas and didn't really have great access to um, like grocery stores or food banks or things like that. So um, can I please have the next slide? And so I mentioned those. Um, those um, places and those nations, but just to put it in a bit of um, context, um, like you can see, I guess I can't really point here, but um, um, North Island, um, Guayastums is off the coast of the North Island. Um, Yalis is located on Cormoran Island, which is um, just a bit south of um, like Port Hardy and Fort Rupert. Um, and then the, um, the other nation, the Moachit Muchalit, they're located about 90 kilometers west of uh, Campbell River on the west coast. Um, can I get the next slide, please? And so these were the knowledge keepers that were chosen. Um, there's Christy on the left there. She was the new Chalnath um, knowledge keeper. And on the right is, um, is Luke, and he was chosen as the, the knowledge keeper with the Wheat Lala U. Uh, next slide, please. And so I mentioned briefly the community of Sakana. This was um, the main location of the work of Christy, um, the knowledge keeper for the New Chalnath. And so they live um, pretty much adjacent to a community called Gold River, um, more of like the settler community. And there is currently no grocery store in either community. And so um, based on this, they were one of the nations that were chosen. Um, pretty much everybody in the community has to drive um, over an hour to get to Campbell River for groceries. 
Um, I believe there are about 200 people living in um, Sakana. So next slide. Um, and one of the, and I, it's really important that I note first that um, the community garden um, was really a vision of the community long before this, and this initiative came on. Like they had this vision um, for years and years and years. Um, but, um, and they did have um, Christy working in this position prior, but we just um, really wanted to fund this because we saw what was going on and we wanted to be a part of it. And so um, once COVID came about, um, they started building their garden. And so this was, um, they've named it the Friendship Community Garden. And you can see there it's located um, behind the, the band office, the health center, the preschool, very um, central in the community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and what they found is that it's been um, a huge success. Like they've had um, people of all ages um, gathering in the garden ever since the start. It's really brought the community together. Um, you can see like they've just had so many volunteers come out um, and they've really, um, it's really brought the community together. Uh, can I have the next slide please? And so you can see in the previous slide, there were um, the elders, they work with the elder program, but they also work with the youth program, um, the Knowledge Keeper. And so they've um, always got a lot of um, ages coming in. And so um, I've just been like completely blown away um, at the response of the community and the bounty of the garden. Um, and I wish I could tell, you know, talk a bit more, but I, it's gonna be very brief. If I could have the next slide, please. And so another um, initiative of, of Christie's was she really wanted to create a pantry in the community. Um, and so this is um, located in the elders building, um, it's temporary. Her hope is to create like a separate pantry adjacent to the garden. Um, but this is um, basically entirely from the garden um, and they've preserved berries from over the summer. Um, as we speak today, I know they're having like a huge um, salmon canning party. I think they have 200 salmon that they're gonna can over the next three days. And it's all gonna go in the pantry and it's all gonna be for community, uh, which is super exciting. Um, can I get the next slide, please? Um, and what she's really focused on as well is creating like um, a Facebook page, the community garden. And so in a community of, I think 200 people, um, I know 90 people are members. Um, they have about 15 families accessing the pantry each week. Um, they have people coming in like um, a few times a week to gather their own food. Um, so it, it's all like really exciting. And so Christy's, um, like constantly posting things on social media around like preserving or like she's in the garden today, like you can come down, this is what we have available. Um, and you can see her promoting the, the fish canning workshop on the left there. Can I get the next slide please? Um, and then the other community I mentioned was the Wheat Lala U. Um, just to put it in a little bit more context, I don't think a lot of people know where they are. Um, they have a tiny little plot of land um, within um, Yalis in Alert Bay. And um, so next slide. And their focus has been a little bit different. I would say the um, previous program is more on um, like the community garden, but this has been more of a focus of like cultural mentorship. And so um, Luke has really mentored, I think um, seven or eight youth from the community, but it's not just um, the youth, like a lot of the men from the community have gotten together and gone out on harvesting trips. 
Um, can I get the next slide? I'm just gonna go through um, a few slides here and, and give you a sense of the activities. Um, they've gone out for um, herring spawn and so um, mentored in like what to look out for, um, where, you know, where, where the spawn's happening, um, how to put out the branches, things like that. Uh, next slide. Uh, this is just another photo of um, the herring eggs after the spawn has happened. Uh, next slide. Uh, going out for crab, that was um, one of the activities. And um, yeah, it's really important to note that like it's a small group of people going out, but um, all of this is given out to the community equally. It's a very small community. And so everything that's harvested or gathered um, goes out to the community. Next slide. Uh, prawns, you can see here. Uh, next slide. I know we're short on time. Um, and you can see that they've gone out for clams as well. Uh, next slide. And, and this is the women cleaning the clams. And one of the things that they really wanted to focus on was getting back to like the old ways. And so um, the program is like the men going out and getting um, the food and the women taking care of the harvest once it comes in. So you can see here as well, um, like people of all ages, uh, women of all ages coming together and working on the clams. And I believe they made soup and um, jarred some of the clams as well. Um, so it's really like a community initiative. Like it's one, it, like it just takes one person I find that can get everybody in the community like really excited about food and get things happening. And so like, it's not a lot of money, but, um, but it's had a huge impact in, in community, which is really exciting. Uh, next slide, please. And um, some of the, the money as well has gone towards um, coordinating a good food box program. And so um, this is um, some of the Wheat Lola U employees going out to Guayastums um, to deliver the good food box. So it's not just, um, it's not just in the Wheat Lola U community, um, it's also um, going out to um, the more remote community of Guayastums, which is really exciting. And um, can I get the next slide, please? So um, I guess in closing, like it's, it's, um, it's a very unique project between um, a health authority and, and First Nations communities. It's really brought like nations together and communities together. Um, I'm hoping that our program will, um, will continue to fund this. I know that they're gonna let me um, report on it and, and pitch it to them, but um, yeah, I could also see like um, FNHA possibly funding this. Um, I just think they've both been incredible successes and like this is exactly what we want. This is what I want. I wanna see more of our foods in the hands of our youth. Um, so with that, I'm gonna say hawa gayasika gila kesla and I'll pass it on to Rachel. Amazing, thank you so much, Jesse. Those are beautiful slides. Um, so I'm going to spend the next um, 10 minutes or so talking about my approach to diabetes, working alongside the Nutanath people. Um, I would say that, you know, number one is always relational practice. And really what that means to me is practicing with a respectful and reflexive approach and always inquiring about the lived experience and healthcare needs of others. Um, I do think that authenticity and compassion are really key elements here. And of course, cultural safety and humility. Um, and so for me, that means practicing with self-reflection, um, but then also um, educating other health professionals that may not, may not be um, that familiar with the impacts of colonization um, on diabetes rates in Indigenous communities. And then of course, self-determination, so taking control of our own health. And then I'm gonna to speak to these other points in the next few slides. So next slide, please. 
Um, so here are some photos um, of some food sovereignty initiatives that are happening along um, in the New Chalneth communities. So for me, food sovereignty um, means reclaiming the power of food, really. And my friend Tom Campbell there is um, um, shucking some clams. And um, he shared with me that in his experience in his lifetime, he's really seen a shift in the availability and the access to a lot of their traditional foods. So the seafoods and the, and the fish. And he feels a lot of that has to do with the impacts of climate change, but also um, government policies. And then beside there is um, some photos of some youth harvesting their own, um, their first seal. Um, and so that's in a house it and a house it is a non treaty nation so they retain the right to hunt seal. And um, beside that is the seal blubber in this smoker. And I also just wanted to acknowledge that communities are doing so many amazing community driven initiatives around food and food sovereignty. Um, so some of the things I'm aware of are um, the connection of food to language, um, taking the youth harvesting, um, reigniting all those skills around harvesting, um, seafood, um, fish, berries, um, and a lot of focus around traditional foods, but also land-based physical activity. So next slide, please. Um, I really love this and Jesse helped to make it graphically mo uh, more beautiful. Um, so this is the new challenge seasonal round. So you can actually find this on the, we've housed it on the National Indigenous Diabetes Association website. There's a tab there that says new challenge resources. So if anyone wants a copy of this, that's where you can find it. And so the seasonal round shows how land and place um, are essential references for the new Chalneth. Um, and other indigenous cultures have their own calendars based on the moons and their landscapes. So right now, um, you can see there's a lot of activity around hunting. Um, and um, from the picture there, you can see that the full moon name for December is Younger Sibling, so time for potlatch. Um, January is the moon of the most snow. And then February is the beginning of the spawn, so referring to the herring spawn. And then March is the herring spawn. And so recently I've been in conversation with Tom Campbell, so from the previous slide, um, and about how we can use this calendar with the youth um, for some programming, programming around some land-based learning, um, specifically around traditional foods. Okay, and next slide, please. So I just want to speak quickly to remote services. So increasing access to diabetes services in these remote communities. Um, so there are 14 new Chalneth nations and they actually span 300 kilometers of the west coast of what's now known as Vancouver Island, including some inland regions. Um, a lot of these communities are boat access only or float plane. Um, so there's me and my colleagues. So I travel often with the nurse, nurses. Um, so a house that is 45 minutes by boat, um, Heshquit or Hot Springs Cove would be um, 20 minutes in a float, float plane. Um, so I think having um, access to more diabetes services in these communities has been really key um, to um, improving the you know, well-being of anyone living with diabetes. So one of the things we're working on right now is increasing access to a virtual endocrinologist. Um, so we got a small grant to do that and we work with the clinic in Vancouver and I sit with the client and we zoom in with the endocrinologist um, for an hour. Um, and we use a lot of continuous glucose monitoring data, which is really awesome because I can either upload that to my computer or send it uh, um, to the physicians on the other side. And then we can look at that data together and then make um, decisions with the community member and with the physicians um, with that valuable information. And for those of you that don't know, continuous glucose monitor or CGM um, is a Libre. So that's kind of pictured there with that 6.5. So that's the Libre. And then newly covered in BC for people on insulin um, is the Dexcom. Um, honestly, it's, I feel like this technology has been life-changing for so many people. Just being able to see that real-time change in your blood sugars when you eat certain things or when you exercise or when you're stressed. 
um, or when you're trying to adjust your medication. So when you're trying to, you know, come off insulin or decrease your medications, um, being able to just do a quick scan of your blood sugars it really puts that power back in people's hands. Um, and then the main difference for those of you that don't know between the Libre and the Dexcom is that the Dexcom is um, continuously feeding out information, whereas the Libre you do have to scan. So with the Dexcom, um, it can have low glucose alerts. So while you're sleeping, if it senses that you're going a little bit low, um, it'll alert and wake you up because it's continuously Bluetoothing that information over. And so so I've seen um, with a few people that I work with, um, the Dexcom's woken them up in the middle of the night because they're dipping low overnight. So they've been able to adjust their insulin so slowly decreasing their insulin based off this information, you know, without my help and without the help of the physicians, now they, they have that power and that knowledge. Um, and so another really valuable tool that we're using um, in remote communities is the, um, the A1C point of care machines. So that's the, the picture there of the poking of the finger. So we have two devices. We have the DCA analyzer. And more recently, we're using the A1C now, which is so handy because it's tiny. It's easy to pack into community. So these devices give um, an A1C reading. So that's your three monthly um, blood sugar reading. So an average over the last three months. Um, and it can be used to diagnose diabetes or pre-diabetes. Um, but often if we get, do get an, an abnormal result, we'll just send it back to the physician um, to kind of interpret or to um, send the community member for some more lab work. Um, and it's also really helpful um, for those who have diabetes who are supposed to be, you know, looking at their A1C every three months just to make sure, um, you know, things are where they want them to be. Um, okay, so next slide, please. And just quickly showing um, the New Chalith Nations and um, how far they span. Um, so I'm here in colloquial territory, which is kind of in the middle there. Um, and so to get to the more northern communities, it, it is quite, um, quite a venture, but we do try and make sure that um, those communities are accessing the diabetes services that they want. Um, okay, so next slide, please. I just wanted to quickly speak to uh, my good friend um, and somebody living with diabetes, Paul Sam. So these photos are actually from this week. We um, did a little bit of filming to share his experience with diabetes. Um, he is a big fan of the, he was on the Libre and now the Dexcom. He has lost um, 50 pounds. He um, has reduced his insulin from 60 units to 10 units um, on his own. Um, I'm there for support, but he's been titrating it back on his own. Um, he tells me he used to be on 14 different medications and now it's less than half. And he's also now pain-free, which is so amazing. Um, and, you know, previously he wasn't able to do much physical activity and now he walks every day and he um, has his electric bike. And he shared his story on multiple different formats for us. And um, pictured there is a story in our Halshilsa newspaper. Um, so you can just Google that and, um, and read about his story a little bit more. And then also there in the photo, he's sharing um, uh, dried apple slices that he's been making in his dehydrator. So he's been really experimenting with lots of different types of healthy foods. But he also shares that when he has the fruit, he always pairs it with some nuts. Um, cause he can see the difference, um, when he's wearing the Libra, the Dexcom that the nuts have on his blood sugar levels. Okay. Next slide, please. Um, this is, um, a cookbook that is also available on the national indigenous diabetes association. So NIDA website, um, prior to COVID the vision for this cookbook was to have community members contribute recipes. Um, and then during the lockdown phase, um, it kind of morphed a little bit. So there's a lot of my recipes there. Um, and recipes from other Indigenous cookbooks and Indigenous organizations, and some recipes from community members. Um, and they're all focused around diabetes, which really is just healthy eating. So kind of lower refined carbs, lots of fiber, um, good amount of protein at every meal. And um, yeah, I think it's been really well received and we're hoping to do a new version in the new year. And next slide, please. So also on the NIDA website, you can find the resources that we've made. Uh, we try to focus a lot on kind of visual photo resources. 
Um, and most of them are related to diabetes, but there's a few other um, resources there if you wanna have a look. Next slide, please. Um, so cooking groups, probably the most fun part of my job. So this one in particular was done um, in a joint effort between the nation, so colloquiate nation, and another, um, another department within NTC, the, so the Child and Youth Services. And my good friend Melody Charlie shared her halibut chowder, which is also in the cookbook, um, and it's based on coconut milk, which is really um, awesome and exciting. And, um, and we also, and the youth helped to make some fish tacos. Uh, next slide, please. And so another part of our diabetes approach is building relationships with other organizations. Um, so I had the honor of working with NIDA on this great resource, which is available on their website called Gifts from Our Relations. So our original food guide. And it's kind of a spinoff on the FNHA traditional food guide. Um, this one covers traditional foods from all across Turtle Island or what is now known as Canada. And so it has recipes, nutrition information, um, but also some cultural teachings. And then on the right side of the screen, um, in partnership with NIDA, NTC is doing some short videos on diabetes and wellness. Um, so there's one on Upsqui, which is dried fish. And then underneath there, you might not be able to recognize him, but that's um, Paul Sam. And that was probably about a year ago. And at that time, he had told me he'd lost 30 pounds. And he comments in the video that, you know, he can now see his toes. And just this week, he told me he can now see his feet. So yeah, so you can kind of watch his story um, on our YouTube channel. Okay, and next slide, please. And this really exciting project was done with Fiona and our good friends at iSpark. Um, it's the Food is Medicine cooking show. So there are four episodes and we travel to four different communities um, and cook some healthy foods. And um, you can find these on the iSpark YouTube channel. And we're hoping that a season two will come out in the new year, so stay tuned. Next slide, please. Um, and then another kind of area in our diabetes approach is um, looking at how research can kind of shape the way um, we're approaching diabetes. So just last month, we found out we were successful with a CIHR um, LOI phase for a vision of a diabetes wellness retreat. Um, and so these diabetes wellness retreats um, are going to bring together the traditional knowledge and then our current biomedical knowledge around diabetes and, and create a space for some knowledge translation to happen. And we partnered with a lot of amazing organizations on that. So including FNHA, Island Health, NIDA, um, and then UBC and SFU. So it was a team grant. So there are 18 people on our team, which is really exciting. Um, and then in the spring, we'll have a strengthening gathering to hear from communities on, on how they envision these retreats. And then we'll apply for the full um, proposal. And then next slide, please. And here I just wanted to share that if anyone's interested in hearing more about what the New Talna Tribal Council is doing for diabetes, we had the opportunity to make a really amazing video on all these different initiatives that I chatted about. Um, and that's available on the NTC YouTube channel. And with that, I'll pass it on to Tessie. Thanks so much. Oh my gosh, there's so many exciting things happening. Uh, thank you, Jesse and Rachel uh, for sharing that. And um, I'm gonna share a little bit about one of the initiatives that I've been honored to work on uh, alongside the team at Nourish over the past four to five years. Um, and this is uh, less, like I love those examples of really community-based and community-driven projects that you both shared. This one's um, more sort of looking at shifting the values and the paradigms around food and particularly food within healthcare. So um, I don't have time to give the whole background of Nourish. I encourage you to check it out. But in a nutshell, it's a community of practice and a program that aims to recognize uh, and amplify the value of food in healthcare and to build the understanding that food is a major factor in health equity, in community wellness, and in reconciliation. And within Nourish, the Food is Our Medicine project uh, focuses on indigenous foodways and traditional food programs within healthcare facilities. 
Um, and I'll just point out that the beautiful artwork here um, we had commissioned by um, an Indigenous artist, Maria Mas Masigwe, uh, earlier this year as part of the Food is Our Medicine uh, Action Learning Series. And uh, next slide. So this photo is um, of the wonderful team behind a lot of the Nourish Indigenous Foodways work, um, missing a few very valued additions who have joined the team since this gathering, which was uh, on uh, Six Nations Haudenosaunee territory in 2019. Um, but here you can see uh, their traditional food champions, um, their elders, knowledge holders, dietitians, and Indigenous health leaders and systems thinkers. And uh, we came together to talk about uh, food and in particular traditional foods within healthcare. And one of the many conversations that guided this work was that um, Many of the team members here were frequently fielding questions about starting traditional food programs in healthcare. So, for example, um, we see Kathy Loon here from Sioux Lookout and Leslie Carson from the Whitehorse General Hospital, both with decades of experience of, of serving traditional foods in, in their respective hospitals and facilities. And people are often reaching out saying, how do I do this in my hospital? Can you send me recipes? Can you send me the how-to uh, guide? So we were grappling with this as a team for a long time, how best to support people um, in their communities, um, but knowing that every community is unique. Um, so we went through uh, a systems mapping process, this group here, to better understand all of the pieces that influence serving traditional food programs and foods in hospitals and long-term care. And what we discovered uh, through these conversations and, and the stories that were shared, we then built the foundation for the Food is Our Medicine uh, learning journey. Next slide. So um, super high level, the learning journey, um, which I think we can post in the chat a link to if you're interested in finding out more. But um, really, we, as I mentioned, from listening to the stories and getting guidance from our advisory and from our elders, was that uh, for people to really start thinking about starting a traditional food program, there is a whole lot of community engagement and relationship building and co-creation that must happen first. And so, yeah, people like, like Kathy and Sue Lookout could not give me advice um, on what recipes to serve when I was on Haida Gwaii or um, you know, any other community. It's unique to each community. And for um, to move forward, you have to build those local relationships. So instead of moving forward with a how-to guide, we decided to create um, and design a learning journey for people to learn more about and reflect on the many aspects and layers and nuances around Indigenous foodways. So it's delivered in four parts that you see here, um, kind of following the four seasons. And the first one for fall, which um, you can see in this uh, beautiful image of corn, uh, is celebrating food as culture. So it's really encouraging those, um, encouraging learners to situate themselves um, and their work on the land that they are on and uh, getting to uh, sort of build relationship with the people of that land, recognizing the cultures and the traditional foods. And, um, and yeah, just celebrating food as a central aspect of culture. And uh, in the winter season, it really explores more the idea of food is relationships. And with relationships forming the foundation of working towards reconciliation, we can sort of recognize the role of food um, in this and how food connects people to place the land and the waters and our homes and to each other. And, the, uh, and then we move into spring where we uh, explore food as healing. And this is where pieces like traditional food guides, like the one uh, Rachel showed, um, different teachings and stories are shared as well as celebrating the diversity of indigenous food ways. So again, recognizing that traditional food systems are very different across Turtle Island and very unique to community. 
And here we also really talk about uh, self-determination as vital to food sovereignty. And in the last season, food is a pathway. This, um, this really looks into showing how indigenous led traditional food programs are thriving in different communities. So great examples are what's already been shared today. Um, and, and then also looking at potential pathways forward uh, in collaboration with um, indigenous partners and communities. Next slide. So one of the teachings that I really love and appreciate that came from the group and uh, our advisory um, that I come back to regularly and that I'd like to share today is this reframing of what we consider work. So Western approaches uh, are so focused on sort of outcomes and numbers and tangible results and productivity. And through my journey, I've been really invited to challenge those ideas and to embrace uh, some of these messages. Um, so spending time and sitting with elders is the work. Building relationships is the work. Suspending judgment is the work. Listening and being on the land is the work. Eating and sharing food is the work. Learning from your process is the work. Sharing your learnings and the knowledge that you grow is the work. So um, yeah, I just find this so powerful and I'm very grateful to those that put, this, uh, put these teachings together. Next slide. So in practice, uh, this next slide is, is an example of, these, of, of the type of paradigm shifts that we can work towards when we create more space for indigenous ways of knowing. So here we are looking at uh, hospital food and we really need to shift from the idea of feeding our patients and residents to nourishing our patients and residents and shifting from the idea of food service as an obligation and something that just needs to be done um, to an honor to serve patients and an opportunity to provide respect and quality care. And then the idea of shifting from best value uh, when we think about food in terms of the dollars and the cents um, to best value in terms of patient experience and feelings of wellness and safety and improved health outcomes. And when we approach food through this paradigm, our perspective and our intention shifts dramatically. And it moves away from just getting the food onto the plate, like give me the recipe, to then embracing the wholeness of Indigenous ways of knowing and being. And uh, I feel like taking steps towards these shifts and co-creating more space for Indigenous ways of knowing and being and doing within healthcare uh, facilities um, and taking direction from Indigenous elders and knowledge carriers, these are the ways forward towards more equitable health services and to healing through food. Uh, next slide. So just quickly, here's an example of what reimagining food and healthcare could look like. Um, I was so excited that one of the long-term care residents uh, was keen to reclaim some of the garden boxes outside of the hospital in Masset on Haida Gwaii. And together we took out the weeds and we refreshed the soil and we planted the seeds and grew lots of greens and herbs. And uh, together we harvested these greens and prepared them and served them alongside uh, see local huckleberries and local tomatoes in that salad um, with local salmon as well from the waters that are right outside the facility. And you can share the animation there, Cynthia. And uh, just wanna say that by offering local and traditional foods in our facilities, um, especially those um, that, uh, in places where um, Indigenous people are the majority, but really anywhere where Indigenous people are accessing care, um, by serving traditional foods, we can honor the land and the water that surround the facilities. And we can acknowledge the culture and the values of the communities and the people. And we can also support economy. So like in this example, support is supporting fish processing facilities. And, uh, and, and really we can ensure, or we can do our uh, best to, to, to work towards um, patients feeling nourished and supported in their health and their well-being. 
and I'll leave it at that for now and pass it over to Fiona. Wow. Um, I'm just so inspired by you three and everything that you shared today. Um, you know, as someone that's worked in your roles and just I'm thinking about the amount of work that you guys are doing to hold up food and then hold up the knowledge keepers in the communities and uh, to center wellness because so often um, healthcare is focused on sick care and I see a lot of you really working on wellness and really holding up healthy food ecosystems so super inspired by you um, we have a few questions we have about 10 minutes um, and so it's lovely that um, we can hear um, you guys respond. So if anyone has any questions, please pop them in the chat. Um, but Elaine, who is call, or calling in, zooming in from the Musqueam Slay with Tooth and Squamish Homelands, um, is a clinical dietitian. And she asks, how can I complement support these initiatives? You know, other than uh, beginning to use these resources that we shared, and I know we shared a lot in the, in the Zoom or the chat, um, but how can she start to complement these resources in the work that she's doing um, as a clinical dietitian? To complement the resources or the work? The work. Uh, sorry, I don't fully. Okay. Yeah. Um, I think like being an advocate um, is really important. Like what I would love to see um, is more indigenous health uh, programs in our healthcare system. Like I, some of the health, um, some of the health authorities have one, but some don't. Um, and possibly advocating for um, for that, I would say um, that seems like quite big because, um, like I know, we're pretty much the only indigenous health dietitians. Um, working for a health authority other than FNHA um, around food security and food sovereignty. So having um, some sort of positions that will, um, that will work um, with indigenous communities. But as a clinical dietitian, um, yeah, I think it can be tough, but like building relationships um, within the system, I would say, like Tessie says, like relationships are the work. Um, I, I do have some clinical dietitians reaching out to me as to how they can help. Um, working with like food hubs, I would connecting with food hubs. I think the more that we're all connected um, within the system, um, it can only benefit us. So um, yeah, I would say that and possibly reaching out to um, like health centers in community. Um, I know there's definitely a shortage of um, like outpatient dietitians working um, in our systems. And so many indigenous peoples don't really have access to um, clinical dietitians. So yeah, trying to build um, some sort of relationship with um, indigenous communities um, and then doing your own work um, like possibly taking Tessie's amazing like nourish um, program um, I would say that would be super beneficial mm, thank you Jesse and we have another dietitian friend Shelly in the um, chat sharing that moving from a clinical approach to a food systems approach um, that prevention is so powerful. And then again, you guys have all said that is um, relationships, but she says here, I find sitting with folks living with diabetes. Oh, <laughs> of course it uh, moved as I was reading it, living with uh, diabetes um, and the elders and the knowledge keepers in the communities to hear what they need. So thank you um, so much. Um, I have one final question. I would love to hear just kind of, I think uh, it would kind of set the table for just leaving us in a good way. So maybe we can, I can ask you one question and each of you can um, spend a bit of time on it. But what are some of your key teachings or words of wisdom after collaborating and working alongside communities? What advice would you provide to others? And I know, Jesse, you kind of mentioned that. How would I ask Rachel first here and then I'll come back to you, Jess. 
Yeah, I mean, I think the advice is kind of the key theme that I heard throughout um, Jesse and, and um, Tessie's presentation, just building relationships and relational practice. And um, for me, it's just showing up in community every week you know, rain or shine, um, and just being there and not necessarily having an agenda, just um, spending time with people and listening to what they want and, and building that trust. And then, you know, in regards to diabetes, recognizing that everyone's in a different stage in their journey. And, you know, when you reach out to somebody, it might not be the right time, but just kind of continuing to be there for them and, you know, just touching base. I use text messaging a lot. How you doing? You know, I'm fine. And then, you know, maybe in a month or two months, you know, they'll be like, oh, you know, I want to reach out to Rachel because I know she's going to be there for me. And we have that relationship now. So yeah, for me, I guess it's just, it's relationship. Thank you, Rachel. Tessie? Um, yeah, I can jump in. I very much echo that as a, a really a key piece. And um, as I'd mentioned a bit before, really recognizing the importance and power of, of self-determination. So not coming in with an idea, say if you're working with a, with a client or family, not coming in with like, okay, this is what we're going to talk about today. Um, this is the plan. And, and if you don't follow the plan, then you're labeled as non-compliant. It's like, no, you have to have to absolutely put that agenda aside and recognize that as a healthcare provider, it's actually an honor and it's a privilege to have a license and to work in healthcare. Um, and that you have to really make sure that when you're sitting with someone, you're actually showing up for what they need. And that if a plan is created, that they're the one um, setting the priorities. And so it's not a matter of compliance or non-compliance. It's a matter of like, did you really listen? And those are just, um, yeah, like, I've learned that the hard way, <laughs> you know, I've had many, many situations where I'm like, oh, that, you know, I think I came in with my agenda and, and I didn't feel that I was uh, good enough as of a listener or I had other things on my mind, for example. And um, yeah, I just think that we need to challenge sort of the idea of professional boundaries that we learn in healthcare, like in uh, sort of where you have to just put yourself, your work self, um, or your non-work self aside when you show up at work, well, really it's, it's not like that when you're working in community and you wanna build relationship and build trust. You have to show up fully. And, um, and that is, yeah, just a, another big learning that, uh, that I really appreciate is that um, for those meaningful connections, um, you have to bring all of yourself and to be humble when you do make mistakes and just continue to commit to learning and, and doing the best you can. Thanks, Tessie. Uh, Jesse, do you have any anything to add? Yeah, just super quick. Um, I guess a bit of a tough lesson, um, like with respect to like relationships and um, community engagement. Um, like it's really a fine line between like finding the right. Um, the right people that you want to engage with and and um keeping the numbers down because i find sometimes um like especially with the the knowledge keepers initiative um like we didn't have a lot of time to um to do engagement it was basically like here's your money you have to um like give this out to community and so we couldn't do any sort of um like a lot of engagement with community um and and both positions i would say have um um confronted some lateral violence within community um so you're just not gonna make everyone happy um with the work that you do sometimes um but just um yeah, like keeping on, like knowing that um, that things are 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 going well, um, and yeah, just like things can be tough sometimes. But um, yeah, I guess that would be my one of my tough lessons that I've encountered recently. Well, thank you, Jesse. I'm noticing the time. And I'm typing to someone in the chat. I love how the questions are coming in. 
And um, someone was just asking, you know, they don't know how to start a garden or how to take the first steps um, to kind of doing some food system redesign. And I feel like that could be a whole other webinar. <laughs> so maybe we're setting the table for you guys to come back and share when you're not sure what are the first steps um, to take and, and how do you develop those connections within your community? Because it is about relationships with different organizations, um, uh, farmers and growers and preservers, and then of course, all the indigenous uh, food knowledge holders in the communities. So I just can't thank you enough. Um, even as I know you guys really well, I learned so much today and I can't uh, thank the UBC Learning Circle enough for holding the space for us. Thank you, Fiona. And wow, uh, Rachel, Fiona, Tessie, Jesse, thanks so much for the amazing session. Thank you for sharing your stories. It was amazing to see how food upholds so much cultural value um, and how it uh, really impacts the overall well being of Indigenous people and how a lot of the intergenerational trauma really affects um, how we eat and how we are nourishing ourselves. Um, thank you for that. And we just want to give a huge thank you to the UBC Learning Circle audience for all your support and love for our events. This session it is actually our last one for the term. As the holidays come around the corner, be sure to consider supporting small Indigenous businesses for gift giving. Cynthia will link us in the chat for extensive lists we've been working on. And thank you uh, for being here today with us on the UBC Learning Circle webinar for 2022, 2021. Um, we will Hope you have a lovely and safe holiday season and we'll see you in the new year. Thank you.